Hey guys, Adam from Tested here from my secret bunker, which is the new name for my cave. And while we are quarantining and sheltering in place for the foreseeable future, I've decided to start regularly live streaming from here in the secret bunker. Um, answering questions you might have, showing you things that I'm building and working on. Uh, and I'm hoping to do this at 1 p.m. every Tuesday, Pacific time, 1 p.m. Pacific time on Tuesdays. Uh, you can find out when we're doing it by following us on social media or signing up on Tested. And if you actually have a question you'd like to submit, well, you can do that uh, on Tested's new Discord server, which you can join following the links below. Stay safe, stay indoors. We will get through this. And, uh, oh, here are some questions that I answered during my last live stream. Um, what are the glowing lights behind me? What are the glowing lights behind me? Oh, those are the, those are the, those are the flame bulbs. That's what those are. Yeah. Let's go see them. All right. Um, yeah. If there's stuff that you want to, this is cool. I mean, I, I should do that slower. If there's stuff you want to ask about. We can certainly start to talk about anything you'd like to talk about. So I have over here, this was, I, I can't remember when I saw that these existed, but these are the LED based fire light bulbs that I used to make my lantern one day build a few months ago. Um, and I kind of like, within the Muppets frame, within Muppets, um, there's this thing that a lot of Muppets have, which is like they have feathers on their heads and they have feathers on their heads. Like, uh, let's see, like, um, oh, ah, like this guy right here, like this guy, he's got this, this marabou or whatever this is up top. And that gives him like this, this secondary movement as a puppet. And I like to have sort of lights going on in the shop as sort of ancillary movement. It's sort of same thing. It lends the shop some character. So I've got like one of those cubes of um, the LEDs where you kind of make shapes in voxels, in, in 3D pixels. I've got one of those playing over in the shelf. It's behind three spacers, so it's a little tough to show you. But uh, yeah, I, I just like that kind of movement. Um, sort of gives the space a kind of a dynamism that I find kind of makes me feel like it's not just a big empty space. Um, Let's see. Is there anything I've missed here? Uh, what is the thing you have to explain the story of to cave visitors the most? Oh, what do people go? Okay, let's 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 let's. I'm gonna walk in and sort of. I, this is. The, I'm walking over to the front door, and this is how most people come in. They 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 walk in and they look around and they're like. Whoa. And I know there's often a little bit of judgment. It's totally fine. It's totally fine. I, you know, these things show up in your head. I can tell people are like, wow, he's a little crazier than I thought. All right. I definitely get that. Also, hmm, he's a little bit of a hoarder. Right. I get that too. I see that on your faces. I don't, that's fine. I don't take it personally. I, in fact, you know, it's instructive. Um, people walk in, they see the C3 but they don't know where to look. This is the thing. A lot of times people come in here and they have no idea where they should be looking because there's just too much to take in. So let's do a spin here of what they might see and we'll, we'll go all the way out there. And so, yeah, so they take a look around and to be honest, I think the T-Rex might be the thing, but let's keep on doing this full circle here. Oh, it looks way denser on camera than it actually does in here. Now I'm saying that and I'll bet any member of my team watching this is like, nap, it's just as dense, you idiot. Um, I think the T-Rex is definitely, is definitely one of the things that gets talked about the most. And it's one of my favorite objects in this whole space. In fact, this T-Rex ate a Terminator that got sent back to the wrong time frame. That's that's the story I'm telling about that uh, endo arm sticking there. Um, this is only about 50 pounds. It's actually, uh, uh, I think it's a spray urethane coated uh, CNC foam, but I'm not exactly positive. It is got a foam base. It's got a hard urethane outer coating that's about an eighth of an inch thick. It's incredibly durable. Uh, I had to re-glue the two halves of the jaw together this little joint right here. 
Uh, I put some dowels in there and did some painting to fix it. And then I had to wire it up so that the jaw hung. But I love it as the pool table light here. It's like, could you imagine? Could you imagine being this low on the food chain? Like if something like that thought of you as a tasty snack, that's 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 a totally different reality right there. That's that's an intense one. Um, so yeah, we we spend a lot of time talking about the T Rex when people come in. Um, the pool table, well, it's just it's always like this. Right now, it's like this because I just want to always be looking at my spacesuits. So all the spacesuits are up right now. Every single suit is on a mannequin because uh, it just really, really thrills me to come in every day and see a whole bunch of spacesuits lined up. <clears throat> uh, all right, let's see here. Uh, do you prefer scratch building and creating sculptures, et cetera, or building kits? or putting your own spin on someone else's models. Um, again, with these either or questions, this is different every time. I, I, I have had surpassingly great experiences doing every single one of those things. Um, I love designing stuff. I love the process of designing stuff. Uh, I love the, the iterative process of slowly workshopping something in my head. That's probably the most fun from the soup to nuts, right? So like, for instance, uh, and we're going to do a show and tell on this, but recently um, I obtained this unbelievable piece. Uh, and this is a prop from the Matrix. And like I said, we'll put up a piece about this. But I've been thinking about um, how to display this guy and how to store it. And ultimately, of course, what I'm thinking about is the kind of box that should go in. Um, and so I have all these designs for boxes that I'm working on, uh, and I've been downloading some inspirational imagery for me, um, which is often like custom, custom cases for militaria and things like that. Um, but also the matrix universe is, it's impossible to call, but Jeff Darrow's designs, they, they, they there is a steampunk. There's a, they're steampunk adjacent, definitely. Uh, so there's bringing in that aesthetic. Ultimately, the idea is I want whatever I store that lightning gun to look like it's a piece of kit from the Nebuchadnezzar. So I want it to look like it would be slotted, it would fit right into the canon of, uh, 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 of the Matrix aesthetic. Uh, and that just, you know, I've watched the Matrix twice in the last three months uh, just to kind of re imbue. And by the way, you just you can't watch that movie too much. That's just not possible. It's totally amazing. Um, all right, let's see here. I'm gonna scratch my ear again. I'm really glad. You know, one of the problems with these AirPods is every time I try and adjust them, I hang up on people. So I'm very glad uh, that I'm not hanging up on y'all. Um, what is your all-time favorite science fiction spacecraft? Come on, the Millennium Falcon. I mean, is there another one? Yes. Firefly Serenity, the Firefly class ship that Mal Reynolds pilots in Firefly is a close second. But the Millennium Falcon, just full stop. I, it's not even really worth discussing at any given length. Uh, don't get me wrong. In a battle, I want the Starship Enterprise. But personally, I want the Millennium Falcon. Uh, what is your personal opinion about laser cutters? I love them. Yeah, I totally love laser cutters. Laser cutters, laser cutters are how I think. Um, oh, right, I can show you something about this. So I first started using laser cutters. Wait a second. Uh, this is the maker shelf, right? Yes, this is all the maker books. Where are the world at your feet books? Wait a second. Mm -hmm. All right. We've got to go to a different library here. I've got a different shelf somewhere else. Um, so when I was a teenager, uh, my local bookstore in Terrytown carried this uh, uh, set of books you could build your um, build your own buildings from. Okay, let's see here. 
Are they in here? There were, I, I'm sort of confused. Ah, there they are. Ha ha. Okay, great. Let's pull one of these out. Yeah, this is one that I made. Okay, so. Here we go. Oh, sorry. Didn't mean to do that. Okay, so thanks for coming with me on that little journey. Uh, so the bookstore had these paper models that you could buy, and they were built into books, and they weren't die cut. You literally, uh, you literally did all the cutting yourself with X-Acto knives. Uh, so it's painstaking, meticulous work, out of which you could do something like build the U.S. Capitol. Now take a look at that. I built that when I was probably 14, and I'm here to tell you that felt like a real accomplishment. Um, Alan Rose the architect and author of these books is actually someone I know. I met him in New York a few years ago. He's a delightful man. Uh, and Alan, Alan's books taught me how to think through uh, planar forms. That is, that is sheets of material meeting each other under certain conditions. Um, so these books, oh my God, so beautiful. Um, you can still buy these on eBay. So here is an example of what these books look like, right? There's the paper folds right there uh, and the arrows that indicate whether you scored on that side. And there are little invisible arrows, which means you have to score it on the other side. So you often have to like go in with a pin and do pre-scoring. before. It's, it's, it's a whole thing. Um, and so I built all the I built probably a dozen of these things over a couple of years between the ages like 14 and 17, 14 and 16. Uh, and. This is these are the books that taught me when you make the Capitol Dome. Actually, that's worth bringing up. When you make the Capitol Dome in this book, you are you are making a compound curve out of a planar material. And that right there, here you go. There is the set of sine curves that make up the Capitol Dome in its sections. And when you cut all that out and it creates a dome, you've just learned in a physical way a really important lesson about how to transfer a material that's flat into a material that can reasonably approximate a compound curve. Um, so I learned a tremendous amount without realizing it by building a whole bunch of these. Uh, and 20 years after that, when I got to Industrial Light and Magic and Don Bees introduced me to the laser cutter, it simply using laser cutter simply utilized those parts of my brain that I had learned to use to make those paper models. And that had made me better at working with foam core and cardboard and all sorts of stuff. But it continued on because I submit that sewing and welding and carpentry and plastic construction are all the same process. It is planar forms meeting under certain rules and conditions. And for me, it all started with that. So when I discovered the laser cutter, it like it just took over that part of my, it used a part of my brain that I already had highly developed. And I became so addicted to the laser cutter that at ILM, I was known as Laser Boy. Okay, I think just Tori Belache called me Laser Boy. I can't remember if anybody else did. I think it was mostly Tori. At any rate, uh, nowadays, even though I have a beautiful Trotec in this building, uh, it's like a 150 watt laser in it. It's a real powerhouse. Um, and I do use it from time to time. But I'm just much more inclined in this space to make everything by hand. And it's not a policy decision. It's just kind of like that's the way I sort of prefer to do it. Um, I'm totally laser cut stuff and then totally will continue to laser cut stuff. Um, I own two lasers. I also have one of uh, the Glowforge here, which I have not yet spooled up in this space, but I will. Um, so I'm not above using that stuff. But in general, I prefer the practice in here of working with my hands, sometimes to my own detriment. Uh, <sighs> have you thought about putting any of your props and various things on tour or in a museum? Well, yes, and that's actually already happened. Um, a bunch of original Mythbusters props, including our shark and some other amazing things, are traveling around the United States for a, the last, like, I think almost... Yeah, now coming on 10 years, the explosive exhibition. I'm not sure where it is right now in the world. I'm sure someone could tell me. Uh, but th that has a bunch of original props, including the original leather jacket I wore for the first like five or six seasons of Mythbusters. So funny to see it in a museum. I'll eventually get it back when that show closes down. Um, 
And I had four of my spacesuits in the San Francisco Museum of Modern Art this uh, this past. Uh, where are we at? Yeah, this past fall, uh, they had a, a wonderful show called Far Out about uh, the virtuous cycle of culture and science and how they promote each other, uh, specifically within the frame of how visions of the future uh, by NASA has ch and by science fiction authors has changed the way we think of the future and changed the way we think of the present and ourselves and our technologies. And so they borrowed four of my suits uh, to go in that exhibit. Um, but you're asking a different question. I, I've definitely, I, I'll tell you, we're, we're moving forward on Silicon, uh, formerly Silicon Valley Comic Con, um, which is still slated for late October. Uh, and as we move forward with that, um, we're talking about creating some, uh, some display spaces so that people can see a bunch of my costumes in one place. Um, because I, I, I love that. I've got, I think now 83 complete costumes over in storage. I have another storage space. <laughs> I have, yeah. I'm still trying to, I got rid of one whole storage space this year, this last year, but I still have two others. Um, yeah, it's a, it, it, it's a process. Okay, uh, let's see. Is the Boston Dynamics spot work on hold until you can work with others in the same room? Uh, you know what? We haven't even talked about that, but I think the answer is yes. Uh, we definitely are moving forward. We are definitely, like, we've been proceeding apace uh, with both the ideation and iteration and discussions with different collaborators. And we have some wonderful people lined up to collaborate on the things I'd like to do with spot and increasing spots abilities and skills. Um, but yeah, uh, all that's kind of gone on hold right now. We're trying to figure out how to run tested while a cameraman can't be in the room with me. So that's still a little bit later down the line. Um, don't get me wrong. Uh, I'm super still psyched about Spot. It's a magnificent piece of engineering. And like I said, we've lined up some spectacular collaborations uh, for increasing Spot's abilities that I'm dying to share with you, but can't just quite yet. Uh, do I consider virtual and physical makers two different kinds of makers? Well, thank you for that softball. No! Not at all, because as I've been saying through, throughout, I think this is sort of the theme of the Q&A here, um, it's not about the thing, it's about what's happening in here. Um, uh, you know, it's like the objects carry so much power and you don't even know the kind of power that they can hold. I want to, I'll talk to you about an object here. This is a cool one. Um, so uh, I often, well, I'll tell you this story. In 1993, I was working on uh, a, a show called Caucasian Chalk Circle at Berkeley Repertory Theater. And um, Jamie Heineman gave me a call and I had never met Jamie before, but he said, hey, I've been hearing about you. And I've been hearing that you make stuff in theater and I'd like to see if you'd bring in a portfolio and show me some of the stuff you do. Cause you know, I'm always looking for good people in special effects. And I thought, Oh my gosh, this is great. I've always wanted to work in special effects. And so I put together a new version of the resume cause I was a freelancer. And instead of bringing a bunch of pictures to him of things that I'd built, I actually brought a bunch of stuff and I don't remember, I really don't remember thinking, I'm going to do something different this time. But boy, was it different. Uh, and I brought, I brought this. I brought this thing here. This is a copper hand that I built uh, to figure out how, how articulated joints might work. And the hand is simply... It's simply the externalization of that process of me trying to work out the mechanics just with a pair of scissors and a sheet of copper. But the, the result of that exercise got me my first job in commercial special effects. 
right? Like that's the way I think about it. The object had the power to do that. And the object was simply the externalization of a mental process. And that, that, that externalization of the mental process got me that job with Jamie that first time. Um, but that kind of problem solving, I mean, it's so hard to test for, but frankly, when I see someone who's got it, I don't need to know anything about their ability to build stuff. It's all about how, how, what goes on in here. It really is. So I don't view that there's, if, if what you're obsessed with is within a completely digital frame and you never make a physical object, I don't have any problem with that at all. Uh, I don't think it's anything lesser. Um, I certainly think it might, you know, with some caveats, I don't think, I, I think that everyone with an engineering degree in the physical sciences should have some practical experience within the physical scientists, not just through digital simulations, but that's really specific. When you're asking about the, 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 the virtual and physical, you're asking about types of makers, you're asking about the creative enterprise. And I'm also, the last thing I'll say about this is that um, gatekeeping is bullshit. So the whole idea of like, well, making a physical thing is better than making a virtual thing. It's like, you're just making words that justify the thing that you're doing. And you should always be suspicious of your own bias because it's everywhere. It's all around you. You live inside your own bias. We all do. Um, but gatekeeping is bullshit and you shouldn't do it. And if you notice that you're doing it, if you're saying something like, well, painting is the only pure art form, yeah, you're just you're just wasting all of our time. I don't care what you think is the perfect art form. I care what's the one that's making you wake up singing, the one that gets you to confront yourself, the one that is like making your workbench make you crazy and then make you sane again. Uh, that's what I'm interested in, and that's all in here. Okay, last question. Last question. Here we go. What question have we not asked that you think or wish we should have? Mm. I, frankly, I was curious if anyone was going to ask about something really specific and strange inside the lid cabinets. That's 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 one of the things I was curious about, um, and no one did, which is fine, which is totally fine. But I think uh, that it behooves me to perhaps to perhaps um, I don't know, like bring you to an object that I haven't really talked about before and just, and, and speak on it. Let's see here. So I'm looking at my cabinets and I'm just wondering what's, uh, what's the peculiar, what is the, oh, um, yeah. Uh, let's see here. <laughs> this, this thing is, is it, it's the, the, the cabinets are all really hard to get into right now. Cause I've got too many figures dressed. Um, let's go over here. Let's go over here to the to the space folder, to the folder. So there's a Freudian slip for you. I said folder because I think of everything as if it's in folders, but in fact, uh, this is this is the physical externalization of my computer folders. This is where I store all of my actual objects here. Um, we got one of Tom Sachs's Swiss passports there. Let's see. What is it? We've got something in here that's particularly fascinating. This is really cool. Um, this is uh, this is a rubber stamp with my clearly with my name on it. Um, but it turns out that the uh, that the name tags on spacesuits, the Apollo spacesuits, like this one. There we go. Like that name tag right there. That the lettering was done with a rubber stamp and uh ryan nagata had this made in the correct font and there were many different fonts there was very strange lack of consistency in some of nasa's output uh in the 60s and early 70s um but there were many different fonts used for those rubber stamps and there's a picture i have from johnson space center of this fishbowl full of original astronaut rubber stamp name tag uh, makers, which is really, really beautiful. Um, and I love the simplicity of like, I was like, what is this? And they were like, oh, we just found it. We didn't know what it was. And then we figured it out. And so like, that's still going on at NASA, right? 
and, and frankly, when you when you if you're lucky enough to visit Johnson and talk to any of the amazing people that work there, frankly, Ames or Huntsville or Kennedy, any of these large facilities, everyone who works there loves what they're doing and is so excited about it. And when you get excited about the esoterica, oh, they get like three times as excited as you. And like, I'm sitting there talking to some of the techs at, at Johnson and I'm like, oh, this glove is so amazing. And they're like, oh, you're really into gloves. Do you want to see our cabinet of old gloves? And I'm like, yeah. And we're looking at this cabinet of old gloves and they're like, mm, maybe we should take them to the cabinet of gloves that no one's opened in 20 years. And then go to this other cabinet. Like, it's like cobwebs and all sorts of, you know, animal droppings and some original prototypes of interior mechanics of gloves from the 60s and the 70s. Um, and those guys are super thrilled uh, about the stuff that they're working on. It's not, they're not jaded about it at all. And that's actually, that's something that typifies uh, almost every scientist I have ever been lucky enough to meet and or collaborate with in my life is that to the last scientists and engineers to me uh, are a class of occupations that seem to elicit a lot of passion in the people that practice those occupations. And I think that speaks really highly of those occupations. I've never met a scientist, a working scientist who did not love their work. And I've met a lot of scientists. Uh, and that's real. That's like, that's, that's a real thing. You know, it's like you, you, I, you know, I, I let my kids know that. Um, I don't know what they're going to end up doing, but, you know, knowing early on that there is a, an occupation that you can find super satisfying and invigorating and, uh, uh, inspiring, uh, that you will remain inspired by doing that thing. That, that, that's real. And that's, that's a worthy goal. It's not always achievable. And again, like I said at the beginning of all this, most of what our jobs are is drudgery. Get through that stuff to the good, <laughs> crispy center inside, the creamy center inside, you get the good stuff. Um, thank you so much for this. I hope you guys have enjoyed a tour uh, through my cave and my shop and my mind. Uh, I hope you are all staying socially distanced. Um, we still have some more time to endure this uh this this quarantine uh i further hope that you and your families and your loved ones and your friends are all safe and sound uh and that the 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 that the world we put back together at the end of all this the the new thing that arises is something that uh that we are all proud of i really i really i have an optimism for that So stay safe, stay vigilant, and be kind to each other and to yourselves. Thanks, everybody. This was awesome. All right. There we go.